Welcome to Art and Object. Uh, this, I think, is our third or fourth video preview. And, and before we begin, I'd just like to say thank you to all of our clients and friends who've given us such wonderful feedback on the video previews we've been doing for the last couple of months. Uh, and we hope you enjoy this one. With me, of course, is Ben Plumley, and uh, we're going to talk about some of the superb artworks in the David and Angela Wright collection, uh, which is currently on view. But before we begin, I just want to let you know about uh, an artist talk that we're having this Saturday, the 25th of June. Gavin Hipkins has uh, very generously agreed to come and talk about his work. This will become uh, a regular feature on our major art exhibitions. Gavin's talk will start at 4 o'clock this Saturday. Of course, we're going to be open this Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. on both Saturday and Sunday, and of course, the days prior to the auction coming up this coming Thursday on the 30th. Now, I'm going to pass you over to Ben, who's going to talk to you about some of uh, his favourite pieces in the collection. Uh, I'm standing in front of uh, Gavin Hipkins' 20-part photographic essay, The Next Cabin. He is a photographer who occasionally delves into, uh, into film. I think his work is some of the most clever and well-informed, art historically speaking and theoretically speaking, photography being produced today. These works here are effectively snapshots that any tourist might take on a trip, this time, through Canada. So what we get is this very cliched um, series of snapshots around how we might perceive Canada or the way we might perceive Canadianness. So we get a lot of shots of uh, the hinterland, the snowy wilderness, um, that coupled with, with, with sort of more bizarre and uncanny snapshots of things like this, this equine gravestone here, um, someone very fondly uh, recalling the memory of their horse, Blinky. This is uh, my particular favourite uh, in the suite, I think. It's um, a car park sign. For those of you who, who do a little bit of writing and spend a little bit of time thinking about uh, grammar and syntax, uh, as I do, um, and how often uh, you can get it wrong, this person, I think, has trumped everyone I know. One of the things that really interests me about David and Angela Wright's collection is the way that David and Angela have, over a 20-odd year period, gone about purchasing the very, very, very best examples by the artists that interest them. John Poulet would be familiar to many of you, but this painting here, I think, is, is, is probably one of the very, very, very best, if not the best, uh, that I've ever had the, uh, the fortune of, uh, of handling. I think the unique thing about these paintings, which, or this series, which has come to be known as the Red Cloud series, is um, the way in which they conflate and unite painting and drawing. So you get these wonderful, strong, red, sanguinous, blood-like clouds, these vines dribbling down, which is so strong visually from a distance. But as you come up close to the painting, the drawing in it is so fascinatingly intricate and beautifully worked I really think it's a painting that, uh, that you'd never tire of. Bill Hammond uh, is another artist uh, who features uh, incredibly prominently in the Wright collection. House and Garden is, uh, features that absolutely classic green, uh, a green uh, so kind of reminiscent and so redolent of, 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 of what we all recognise in Bill Hammond's work that it's almost really kind of come to be known as Hammond Green. Whilst uh, pointing uh, at a way forward and obviously being all about Hammond's classic bird paintings, the really nice thing about it is the way it recalls the pre-bird Hammond. The rock and roll paintings of the, uh, of the 80s feature heavily in this. There's a wonderful little television screen, and in that television screen, it's like a little vignette, a little snapshot of a lot of those earlier works. The one on the right has a totally different feel about it. It's a whole different birdland. It's like a a wonderful underworld uh, where nothing applies, there's no gravity laws, and it's all overseen by this huge bird who uh, is almost the master of the dance, the lord of all the other birds. The two paintings are, are immensely impressive. They, the whole room, they almost anchor the whole room, the whole viewing is sort of centered around you and they, and they pull you in, you gravitate towards them. But also once you get up close, it's the lovely details, I believe, which really make these paintings truly uh, Truly wonderful. This magnificent canvas from 1985 by Ralph Hotary uh, is one of three major works by Hotary in this catalogue. Uh, this is the largest work from 1985, Dawnwater Poem, and it is uh, a strident protest painting. Remember, in 1985, New Zealand was shocked by the sinking of the Rainbow Warrior. Uh, the Rainbow Warrior was about to set sail 
to protest the nuclear testing by France in the atoll of Mururoa. So this painting by uh, Ralph Hotary is a direct response, is a protest to that shocking act, that act of sabotage which took, took place in New Zealand, but also the bigger picture of course, uh, it is a plea for the environment. And we see in this painting uh, some of the most, uh, can we say, aggressive and high key painting of uh, Hotary's career with this incendiary, splashing, expressionist red uh, around the extremity of the canvas and this wonderful, simple, elegiac symbol for the rising sun. The rising sun connection uh, is made uh, explicit here with this quote from Bill Manhai's Dawn Water Poem. And he uses the terms and the words from the Dawn Water Poem repeatedly throughout the 1970s and the 1980s. And here we have the word sunrise. In this large canvas, I think he is asking a very simple question. Will we continue to see the sun rising if activities such as Mura continue to take place? And I think this is a really interesting question when we ask, can art make a difference? Because in both cases, I think the answer is yes. Very soon after this, nuclear testing ceased taking place in Mura and the same thing happened with the black window paintings. The aluminium smelter ultimately did not uh, proceed. One of the unique characteristics of New Zealand art is the placement of text within painting. A couple of years ago, I, I was very fortunate to see two really great New Zealand paintings side by side. Uh, the Urawera Triptych by Colin McCann and Peter Robinson's Strategic Plan. There's a real connection between McCann and Robinson and it is in the use of text and here it is very specifically in the term boy am I scared or in this case boy am I scarred. See the smaller r in there turning the scared into scarred. McCann's use of that text of course is within uh, a Christian context uh, evoking a sense of wonder, mystery and fear in front of the, the majesty and the unknowable power uh, of God. Te Papa, New Zealand's National Museum, had just opened in 1998. And if you recall, there was very much a live debate about how the arts and our culture, who owned them, who got to decide how they were displayed. And I think that that conversation is further alluded to in this symbol here, which again is a reference to either the thumbprint or indeed the Te Papa logo, which is a derivation of the thumbprint. So here in this particular work, we have Robinson looking back at the New Zealand canon, to a certain extent lining up Colin McCann and questioning uh, his place within that canon, but also, of course, acknowledging it by a direct quotation. But at the same time, he has moved that conversation from being scared, being frightened, to the idea that somehow or other the canon, the conversation about the New Zealand arts could be something that is damaging. It's ironic. I think Robinson is saying, I'm not scarred. He's a young artist at this stage in the 1990s and he is setting out his stall to say that there is fresh life within the New Zealand conversation. It doesn't end with McCann. Two years after Boy Am I Scarred, Peter Robinson represented New Zealand at the Venice Biennale. His installation was called The Divine Comedy. And this work, untitled, uh, comes from that period and is very similar to the works were, that were exhibited at the 49th Venice Biennale. These works are known as the binary works because they use the binary code. So the world and all the information in it in terms of binary code is reduced to sequences of zeros and ones. And in these works, of which there are a number, uh, that use different palettes, we see the binary code being played out. And this is very much part of Robinson's program looking at ideas of identity, ideas of authenticity, and how information is processed, transmitted, and consumed. And this really is a, a masterpiece by Shane Cotton, the painting Spirits Bay. Spirits Bay, of course, is where the Maori departed spirits leave the earthly realm and go into the afterlife. And this painting here is uh, very much a, a guide memoir of the coastline of Northland on the journey to Spirits Bay. So as we move along the canvas, we can see Waitangi, Russell, Rafferty, Hokianga. It's called the coastline of remembrance. Different staging posts along the coastline of New Zealand until you get to Spirits Bay. 
And in this canvas, cotton evokes a deep sense of mystery about the great journey from life to death and the mystery of the afterlife. 